Hello, everyone, and welcome to our presentation. My name is Janine Donnelly. I am the manager of webinars for IBM Systems Magazine, and I will be the moderator for today's event. Today's webinar, Introducing Alpar Sets, Save Your Most Expensive MSUs, Soft Capping Optional, is sponsored by Throughput Manager. Our featured speakers today are John Baker and Selby Shanley. John is a ZOS performance specialist with over 20 years' experience as a user and consultant. He has assisted many of the world's largest data center customers with their ZOS performance challenges. John has held area chair positions with CMG and is a popular speaker at CMG, SHARE, and IBM conferences. Selby is a principal designer and developer of Throughput Manager Automated Capacity Management and is MVS Solutions resident subject matter expert. Selby is steeped in mainframe technology and is well known globally as a ZOS, JES2, and WLM expert. Today, John and Selby will introduce Alpar Sets, a flexible means to ensure capacity is delivered when and where it is needed all while controlling CPU consumption, where it provides the most financial benefit, with or without capping. With our introductions complete, John, I will turn the presentation over to you. Thanks, Jean. And thank you, everyone, for attending. I see we've got a lot of people across time zones today, so we really appreciate uh, you being with us. Just a, uh, we're going to do a quick review of subcapacity pricing, uh, not spend too much time on that, a little bit of review of soft capping, with most of you should be familiar with, and then we'll do a brief uh, throughput manager overview for some of our new audience members that might not be familiar with the fundamentals of throughput manager. But we're going to spend most of our time talking about the automated capacity management function within throughput manager automation, a uh, bit of review of how ACM works, how it can lower your four-hour rolling average, and then we're going to focus on the, the new function that Selby has developed, ACM LPAR sets, and he's going to go through a number of examples of how you can use LPAR sets to lower your four-hour rolling average in your installation. Um, at the end, just talk a little bit about how much you can save, how we can look at some of your data, and as usual, we'll have lots of time at the end for your questions. Just a quick uh, review of subcapacity pricing. Uh, most of you uh, should be familiar with subcapacity pricing by now. It's been IBM's primary offering on how software is built for well over 10 years. Um, the main point here is simply that subcapacity pricing is a consumption-based model. Uh, so anything you can do to reduce your consumption saves money, and that's what we really like to focus on. Now here we've got a sample uh, workload license charge tiers uh, table. The idea here is just to give you an idea of how much money we're talking about. As you can see, each software product is individually priced and the charges are cumulative based on your consumption, once again. Again, we're talking about a lot of money here. In this example, we've got a single CPC with a rolling four hour average peak of 1,000 MSUs. If this particular installation was licensed for the five products listed there, that would uh, cost well over $660,000 per month, just the workload license charges for those products. So again, we're talking about a lot of money here. Incidentally, I'm just going to mention at the bottom of the slide there, country multiplex pricing. Uh, that was uh, announced generally available as of last October. Some of you might be looking at that. Uh, it does add additional tiers, so your incremental rate will continue to go down for larger installations. But, uh, as they say, that story is for another day. Now, I want to talk a little bit about what is a peak. Um, the term is used generically sometimes uh, when you think, if you were to answer the question, well, when is my peak? Well, my peak, I would say, is uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon on the last Friday of the month. Well, what peak are we talking about? In the chart here, you can see what I've labeled as the CPU peak. That would very likely be the highest utilization when the machine is at its busiest uh, and performance uh, is potentially an issue. But when we're talking about cost, we're talking about a four-hour rolling average peak, which is a much 
uh, slower moving line, the dark blue line across there. And as you can see in this example, the four hour rolling average peak didn't occur until one o'clock in the afternoon, uh, fully three hours after the utilization peak. The point being here is if you want to control your costs, you can't just look at the four hour rolling average peak individual interval. You can't even just look at that hour. You actually want to look at the previous four hours exactly as the term suggests. So if your four hour rolling average peak was at one o'clock as in the example here, you actually want to look at all of the work that ran going back to nine o'clock in the morning up until one o'clock because all of that work, regardless of its profile or its priority, contributed CPU time, which means it contributed to your software bill. Now, one of the more common methods to control software costs is with uh, soft caps. Um, there are a couple of options that IBM provides. Originally, they came up with uh, defined capacity. Uh, that runs on a single LPAR. Of course, the benefit of this is your invoice will be based on the four-hour rolling average peak or the cap limit, whichever is lower. So you would not be charged uh, if your four-hour rolling average were to exceed this, the actual cap limit. Now, there can be some penalties for that, and we'll talk about that in a second. The other option is group capacity, or LPAR groups, as they're often referred to. That allows you to set a single limit for a group of LPARs on the same machine. Uh, and again, the same rules apply. If your four-hour rolling average exceeds that group limit, then the LPAR or LPARs would be capped, and this can affect the performance of all your workloads. My point there about granularity is that the entire LPAR is capped by PRISM. You don't have any direct control over which applications would be impacted by the soft capping. Now, sometimes the effect of the four hour rolling average exceeding a soft cap is referred to as hitting the wall. And it's kind of like the effect you see here. What I've got is a machine with two LPARs, and you can see with the, uh, with the purple and the green lines there, the consumption in MSUs uh, from those two LPARs on the same machine. And then the dark blue line represents the combined four hour rolling average on the machine. As you can see, the consumption of those LPARs can freely exceed the soft cap limit. That's the dark black line going straight across until the four hour rolling average exceeds that limit. When that occurs, then the consumption is capped. And the consumption is capped until the four hour rolling average comes back down again. And as you can see, it continues to rise. The average continues to rise because of the high consumption in the previous intervals. Remember, we're accounting for the previous four hours. So in this uh, example here, all of the workloads were potentially affected for over two hours. And what shops often end up doing in such an event is they raise the cap in order to provide relief, stop the phone from ringing essentially, and allow the applications to run again. Because the effect of being capped is very much like being a smaller machine for this period of time. Of course, the problem with raising the cap is then you've now uh, defeated the purpose of capping in the first place because you're going to raise your software bill along with that. So rather than capping, what if you could reduce demand, as said here? This would lower your four hour rolling average and your resulting monthly license charges. Now, what would you reduce if you did have this control? I think it's fairly obvious from what we're saying here. You can't really reduce uh, online transactions where you've got a human being, you know, potentially uh, uh, paying for a bill at a restaurant or uh, paying for a shopping bill or something like that. They're waiting for a response. You can't delay that. Even TSO, you've got developers that are doing work. You don't want them staring at a clock on the screen no more than any of us like staring at a clock when we're Googling something. But batch runs in minutes, hours, sometimes even days. So small reductions that can reduce your four hour rolling average and save MSUs without having a dramatic impact on the runtime uh, just makes sense to target that particular workload. It also contributes, whether you might know it or not, quite often when we talk about peaks, we also talk about what's driving the peak. We hear the term, well, my online drives my peak because it's at two o'clock in the afternoon. Well, what does that mean? Drives might refer to, well, it's the largest component of the workload. 
And in many examples, I'm sure that's the case. What we have here is a chart from a customer only showing the daytime. Each bar represents a single day in the month, and we're showing the breakdown of the batch and the online and the system uh, workloads. Not individual service classes here, but just general categories. We know that lots of batch runs at night, but during the day, as you can see here, there's still a significant batch contribution. Just because it's running at a lower priority doesn't mean it's not consuming CPU or MSUs in this case, and it is contributing to your software bill. And again, it's the most likely workload that you can defer. Now, what about doing this yourself? Well, there's WLM initiators might seem like a good idea because they will automatically uh, adjust to conditions. But WLM initiators are designed to adjust to utilization. They're not sensitive whatsoever to the four-hour rolling average, which is, again, what you're being built on. So they're not going to make any difference at all. Manual operations, uh, you can have operators that start and stop initiators on the fly or, or change classes. Maybe you uh, manually hold and release certain jobs. Uh, we do have some uh, large customers that have tried to do that in the past. It, it really doesn't work because uh, the point is, is not that you're not very capable or that your staff is not very capable. It's that you can't keep up with the machine. Your workload demands, especially with uh, online and things like that, coming in fast and furious and unexpected, you suddenly have large changes in utilization and in workload demand. Maybe something happened on the machine, uh, which has taken away some of your capacity. You have a WLM policy adjustment interval every 10 seconds. So the point is we simply can't evaluate all of the information that's coming in and then react at machine speed in order to make sure that the right work runs in the right place at the right time in order to meet business needs as well as control costs. So we have to automate this, and this is where Throughput Manager comes in. So again, for those of you new to our audience that are, are not familiar with what Throughput Manager is, I'll just take a few minutes to describe uh, what Throughput Manager is all about. Uh, Throughput Manager is enterprise software. It runs as a started task on each LPAR. Uh, it's connected and interfaces with JES2 and WLM, automates uh, all of your batch from start to finish. So when a job is first submitted, whether from a scheduler or from a user, as soon as it hits the JES2 internal reader, uh, Throughput Manager will intercept that job and start uh, managing it. Now it has two primary automation components within our Throughput Manager automation. The first we refer to as Service Level Manager or SLM. This is the automation engine within Throughput Manager that provides automated initiators, uh, puts all the work into a single queue, into a single class, automatically orders all the work by business need, business importance or urgency. And this is automatically reviewed and reevaluated every 10 seconds, just like a WLM policy adjustment interval. So when you're not busy, maybe you don't care. But when your system does get very busy, what this ensures is that the most critical work always runs first. Um, and by automating those initiators in the queues, you can meet those goals. We're going to talk mostly about automated capacity management today, though. This is the component that deals directly with the cost aspects. SLM is already going to make sure that you meet your business goals. What ACM allows you to do is meet your budget goals by lowering that for our rolling average and giving you the ability to selectively control uh, what workloads are constrained rather than capping an entire LPAR. So as I just mentioned, Throughput Manager Automation will analyze the utilization of the machine and all of the LPARs every 10 seconds We'll analyze the workload performance and importance. So uh, for the, the techies in the room, what we're doing, we're looking at velocities. We're looking at the performance index of your workloads. And we're making decisions about when and where uh, work should run. We're also aware of any specific uh, system affinities or resources uh, requirements for all the batch workloads so they run on the right systems. But in addition to that, what automated capacity management will do is it will be aware of any soft caps. So if you've got defined capacity or group capacity limits, ACM knows that they're there. It knows what the limits are. And if you change them, it will know what they are again. You don't need to define that. We're aware of the four-hour rolling average on each LPAR and the current CPU consumption, so we can track trends. 
And if you specify a four-hour rolling average target, we'll be aware of that. Selby's going to talk more about that later, where you can have a target limit without a cap, and ACM can constrain your workloads accordingly. So just briefly how ACM works. I like to think that first thing this gives you is control over what workload. I don't want to cap the entire elk bar. I want to decide what workload to constrain. Even with batch, you may very well decide, well, this group of batch jobs are critical. They should never be constrained, even for budgetary purposes. They need to have full access to all the resources on the machine all the time. That's no problem. You can define that. When? If I have decided that a workload is eligible for capacity management, just because it's eligible doesn't mean it's always capped. That's like a resource group. You can cap something all the time. But why do that if your four-hour rolling average isn't at a peak? You're not paying anything more for it anyway. Why not let it run at full speed? So you want to constrain that only when your targets are being approached. And then how? How do you want to constrain this workload? You can constrain based on concurrency simply saying that, well, normally this group of jobs is allowed to run, say, 20 concurrently. But under these conditions, I'm going to limit that to 10 or 5 or none. Or if a job is already executing, there's not much point in uh, trying to drain an initiator or use a manual method like that. But what ACM can do is automatically move an executing job from its current service class into a discretionary service class with a resource group limit that you have specified. And you can have various resource groups at various sizes and automatically move the work through those resource groups, uh, essentially as you're getting closer and closer to your uh, target limit, further constraining the workload. And of course, that's what we're talking about with the final bullet, is how much do I want to constrain? Do I want to cut the number of jobs all the way down to two or three or zero for a given category of work? the resource group capacity, do I want to cut that down to say 10 or 20 percent of an LPAR or perhaps 2 percent? Maybe I really want to slow things down. You have the control to make these granular choices. Now here's just a quick example of what this looks like within the TM automation policy. We implement this as percentages of your target. So in this case, your target is, for example, 1,000 MSUs. Whether I have a cap or not, I've decided that I don't want to exceed a four-hour rolling average of 1,000 MSUs. So your highest percentage, you can see at the bottom there, is 99.9, or effectively 1,000, and the action that will be taken by ACM. But we mentioned earlier when we were looking at the, the 1 o'clock in the afternoon versus the 9 o'clock CPU peak, we need to start early. We need to be proactive if we want to actually control the four-hour rolling average. We don't want to wait until we get to 1,000 and then try and do something about it, because I can guarantee you, you can stop all of your workload if your four-hour rolling average is just hit 1,000. That four-hour rolling average will continue to rise. It's too late. So what we do is go back earlier. That's what these percentage are, 80, 85, 90%. Now, those are customizable percentages, by the way. You don't have to start at that particular number. You can set your number. But in this example, 80% equals 800 MSUs. So what that means is, before I reach my limit, at 800 MSUs in a four-hour rolling average, I'm going to start taking some action. And there's some examples here of the type of action that you can take, uh, starting with very low priority work and some modest constraints and gradually increasing the type of constraints and the, and the severity of the constraints, if you will, as you get closer and closer to your desired limit, thereby slowly, gradually pulling down the uh, consumption of the selected batch work and lowering the four-hour rolling average. Now this is what this looks like in action. It essentially combines this into three primary phases. So in the early phase, as I mentioned, you're gradually constraining the lowest priority work. You're not at your peak yet, but you're approaching it. ACM detects that you're approaching it. It's gradually slowing down that uh, selected work. You get into phase two, this is where I'm at or, or, or even above my actual peak. During this phase, ACM is going to be constraining the workload to the maximum ex extent that you have specified within the policy. So really holding the line on your budget requirements while at the same time 
protecting your most critical workloads by ensuring they have unfettered access to the hardware. The third phase is also important because you don't want to just say manually hold things back and then try and remember how to put Humpty back together again. So in this case, ACM will remember, oh, this particular workload normally runs in this service class. I had moved it to this resource group because of the policy. Now that I can see things are starting to come down, I'm going to move it back into its original service class. Similarly, with any concurrency constraints, if we've decided to reduce the concurrency of jobs down to two or three or zero, those restrictions will also be removed. So what you have is a smooth resumption of workload, essentially getting things going again while still keeping an eye on the budget. This is another example taking us back to that chart we saw before. You could see we we peaked at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. That was the four-hour rolling average peak in the chart in the top left. And this particular installation decided they wanted a 10% reduction in their costs, reasonable, modest value. So they selected a four-hour rolling average value of 265, plugged that into the policy, selected the workloads that they wanted the constraint and the level of constraint, and let ACM do its work. And as you can see in the bottom right, what ends up happening is this gradual selected reduction that I talked about, uh, which gradually brings down the four-hour rolling average. So the pink line now is a new four-hour rolling average. It actually peaks a little bit sooner, but lower. And this gives them the savings they wanted while protecting those critical workloads. Now, we always like to say, well, what more can be done? Some other considerations. We alluded this uh, in the uh, abstract of today's session. Uh, all LPARs are not created equal. Let's face it, you very likely have different software products installed on different LPARs. At a very high level, this can mean it, um, very simply, some LPARs cost more than others. Maybe you want to control individual uses of some LPARs or group them by applications. Maybe you don't want a soft cap at all. Maybe some LPARs are contributing to the four-hour rolling average, as all LPARs do to a greater or lesser degree in the machine, but maybe because of uh, business or other reasons, they cannot be capped. The point is you might need some additional flexibility in how you can constrain your workloads and keep costs in check. Now, I'm going to pass the baton over to Selby, and he is going to talk to you about some wonderful improvements that we've made in automated capacity management that help you meet these goals in particular. We call them LPAR sets. Thanks, John. Let's start by explaining what an LPAR set is. Well, an ACM LPAR set is an installation-defined group of one or more ZOS LPARs that are on the same CPC. These LPARs do not have to be in the same SysPlex, and each LPAR can be in more than one LPAR set. Note that this is an improvement on LPAR groups where an LPAR can be in one and only one LPAR group. Each LPAR set has an associated 4-hour rolling average limit that is used by ACM. We will see that shortly. The LPARs in each set may also have a defined capacity and or be a member of an LPAR group, but it is not required. Later on, we'll have some examples showing how you can use LPAR sets with or without LPAR groups. And since LPAR sets are only known to automated capacity management, exceeding the limit for a set will not cause soft capping. Instead, ACM uses the LPAR set limits to trigger actions like John talked about to limit batch workload demand to control the four-hour rolling average. Along with other throughput manager automation parameters, ACM LPAR sets are defined in the throughput manager automation policy. The process is very straightforward. For each CPC in the JESPLEX, create your LPAR sets by giving them a unique name, selecting the LPARs that are to be members of the set, and setting the four-hour rolling average limit for each set. Once you have configured your LPAR sets, you can activate the new policy using the policy dialog or an operator command. This can be done on the fly 
there's no need to restart or drain any component. Throughput Manager starts using the new policy on all members of the JESPLEX immediately. Should you wish to create new LPAR sets or alter the limits of existing LPAR sets, you can do so by activating an updated policy. If you are initially uncertain of what limit to provide for an LPAR set, you can tell ACM to monitor and display the 4-hour rolling average for the LPAR set, but not take any actions as a result. Once you have determined the limit, you simply update the policy and activate it. Every five minutes on every LPAR in the JESPLEX, ACM calculates the 4-hour rolling average for every LPAR set of which the LPAR is a member. If the LPAR is also a member of an LPAR group or has a defined capacity, ACM calculates the 4-hour rolling averages for the LPAR group and the LPAR. Next, ACM determines the percentage of each limit that has been reached or exceeded. The highest percentage is considered to be the most important. The installation specifies which batch workloads are to be constrained, as John talked about, and how they are to be constrained at each of the five different percentage levels of the 4-hour rolling average. The main idea is that as the percentage rises, more work should be held back. ACM uses the highest percentage across all the limits to determine which level of constraint should be applied to batch. For example, if one LPAR set is at 50% of its limit and another LPAR set is at 95% of its limit, ACM will use the 95% value. Also, as John explained earlier, ACM applies the constraints gradually to start reducing batch workload demand as the 4-hour rolling average approaches the limit. By the time the 4-hour rolling average is very near or at the limit, ACM is reducing batch demand to the full extent specified by the installation in the throughput manager policy. Once the average starts to come down, ACM will gradually relax the constraints, allowing more batch workload access to CPU cycles. You can use LPAR sets on their own to reduce demand and lower the peak 4-hour rolling average. This is most useful in an environment where soft capping is not desired. In other words, there's no defined capacity or group capacity limit in the LPAR definition. Simply define and activate the desired LPAR sets to throughput manager, and ACM will reduce batch workload as the average increases without any use of soft capping. John and I thought it would be helpful to show you some examples of using LPAR sets in different situations. So we're going to look at the following. Grouping LPARs by software stack cost and by software product. Using LPAR sets and an LPAR group. Grouping LPARs by load type, the classic split between production and development. And finally, managing the 4-hour rolling average when there is a special LPAR that must not be constrained in any way. All the examples show LPARs in the same CPC. Of course, these solutions can be replicated across every CPC in the installation. Here we see an installation with several LPARs and a very typical list of major software products, MQ series, IMS, CICS, DB2, and of course, ZOS itself. As is very common, not all products run on every LPAR, a strategy that on its own saves software charges. In this case, the software stacks have been categorized as high, medium, and low cost with three LPAR sets defined to match these. The limits are set with the incremental cost per MSU in mind, allowing ACM to aggressively reduce batch load to control the high cost LPAR. The low cost LPAR on the right, LPAR 4, can be managed much more loosely due to the reduced financial impact. Obviously, the strategy for managing the set of LPAR 2 and LPAR 3 would be somewhere in between the other two. In this example, LPAR sets have been defined by the major software products. Note that since DB2 and MQ are on the same LPARs, these are covered by a single LPAR set. The SCRT report will show the peak 4-hour rolling average by product, which you can use to establish an appropriate limit for each of these LPAR sets, 
allowing greater control over individual product costs. This installation is prepared to use soft capping, and so we have implemented an LPAR group with LPAR 1, 2, and 3, where IMS, DB2, CICS, and MQ are running. LPAR sets are still defined to independently manage any batch load on the IMS and CICS LPARs, as well as the all-Z LPAR set of all of the LPARs. In this configuration, ACM will manage batch workload on LPARs 1 through 3 using the LPAR group limit, the LPAR sets for IMS and CICS as applicable, and the all-Z LPAR set. LPAR 4 will be managed using just the all-Z LPAR set. Soft capping will be activated by the high 4-R rolling average on the major, more expensive LPARs, but not by the low-cost LPAR-4. LPAR sets provide additional control, both at the product level and across all of the LPARs. Here we have an example where the installation has isolated production and development load by putting each on separate JESPLEXs on the same CPC. They want to control their software costs, but only constrain the development workload. In the production JESPLEX, there are no LPAR sets to find. Production work will not be constrained by ACM. In the development JESPLEX, an LPAR set has been defined that covers all LPARs. This will cause installation-specified development work to be constrained when the overall development plus production for our rolling average approaches the desired limit. Production work, since it is on a separate JESPLEX, is not affected in any way. This arrangement has an additional benefit. It enables development work to run unrestricted when production is not busy and the 4-hour rolling average for all LPARs is not near the limit. Some installations have one or more LPARs which must be treated differently than others. For example, the installation may be contractually ob obligated to provide a given le level of service, and the LPAR must not be capped or constrained. The work in the LPAR may even be from another organization or corporate entity. However, load on special LPARs still contributes to the 4-hour rolling average, so what to do? By implementing an LPAR set, as you see here, ACM on the other LPARs can reduce batch workload demand in reaction to the overall 4-hour rolling average, all without affecting the special LPAR. If desired, an LPAR group comprised of just the other non-special LPARs could be added. These examples should give you some ideas about how ACM could help your installation manage its 4-hour rolling average and reduce MLC charges. John? Thanks, Elby. So I hope some of those examples have given you some ideas of how you could use LPAR sets to reduce your software costs. Uh, obviously, you may come up with some examples of your own. Now, if you're wondering just how much you can save with Throughput Manager Automation, just send us your data. What we'll do, we calculate the top 50 for our rolling average peaks in a month and calculate the batch contribution to those peaks. This provides a reasonable estimate of potential savings. You can't just look at the number one peak uh, in a given month and figure out what you could save. That wouldn't work. But as you can see in the example here, uh, you are talking about a significant amount of money once again. And we do find most of our customers see a return on investment in 8 to 12 months based just on IBM monthly license charges. So in summary, I'd just like to say this. As capacity management professionals, we know that we need to control costs while providing reliable service to our critical applications. We know what our most critical applications and budgetary limits are. But what we can't do as human beings is analyze and react at machine speeds to changes in workload demands and machine utilization while simultaneously holding the line on those budget limitations. With ACM, 
you customize your policy to meet your business goals and watch the automation work its magic. Here's our contact information, as we mentioned before, if you'd like to uh, send us some of our data. At this point, I'd like to pass uh, the mic back to Janine, and we would be happy to take your questions. Thank you, John. We do have some questions that have come in, but I'd like to invite all our attendees to go ahead and to continue to submit questions. Um, you can do that in the Q&A panel on the lower right-hand side of your screen, and please direct those to all panelists. Okay, John, um, how many LPAR sets can be defined? How many LPAR sets can be defined? I believe the number is eight, but I will check with the man himself, Selby. Yes, that's correct. You can define eight on each CPC. So every CPC in your uh, installation can have eight. So if you have two, obviously you can have 16, and so on and so forth. Okay. And here's one for me. Will the slides be available? Um, I just wanted to let you know that the slides will be made available, uh, compliments of our friends at Throughput Manager. So be on the lookout for our uh, follow-up email, which will go out early next week, and it will include a link to the recording as well as a link to a PDF of the slides. Okay, here is another question for Selby or John. Um, with Throughput Manager, do you still define service classes and resource groups in the WLM policy, or is it inside the TM policy? I hope I'm making sense yep. of that. <laughs> no, okay. that makes perfect sense, and, that, and that's a good question. No, we're not reinventing the wheel here. You still define your service classes and resource groups to Workload Manager as you normally would. Uh, the difference is you don't classify the work directly into those. You simply provide those service class resource group names to the Throughput Manager policy, and uh, within there you specify when and how they're used. Okay. How does Throughput Manager control the four-hour rolling average without using a soft cap? I'm going to let Selby go with that one. Well, it's simply put, it's by reducing demand. So that, uh, as as we described in the uh, in the uh, presentation, as the load comes in, we classify it and we identify the work that you and the installation has said can be constrained. And when we hit that level of utilization, we start constraining it. And a couple of ways that reduce the demand are you don't run as many, so that's the concurrency that John was talking about. And the other way is to put it in a new service class that belongs to a resource group in it that has been defined in the WM policy to have a maximum. And it's that maximum that constrains all of the work that gets put in that service class to a certain percentage of the LPAR. The resource group has to be set up so that it is system-oriented, in other words, LPAR-oriented, not SysPlex-oriented, so that we can control how much CPU gets allocated. And the idea is that as the percentage rises, the percentage of the four-hour rolling average limit, then you change it to use a di even a different service class with a more restricted resource group maximum. And so the amount of CPU that that workload that you have selected to be deferred is allowed to access gets less and less. And so that stops the, for the growth in the four-hour rolling average. And as you saw in the graph that John had, it causes it to flatten out and prevents it, often present, prevents it from going through the limit. Okay. Um, how does this apply to the new CMP licensing? Sure. Good question. Um, CMP stands for Country Multiplex Pricing. This is uh, IBM's new offering where they've increased the sizes of the tiers for large installations. Uh, but the short answer is, it to me, it can be even more useful in an environment like that because you no longer have these, uh, what we used to refer to as shamplexes that are necessary. It's still a consumption-based uh, metric 
and you still want to control your four-hour rolling average as much as possible. In fact, I would really emphasize uh, using uh, ACM controls prior to converting to CMP because the biggest gotcha, I'll call it that, with CMP is that your future price is based on your uh, existing consumption. And there are some details to that. I don't want to spend too much time, but essentially you are, you're going to set a baseline uh, based on your current consumption to IBM, and that will affect your uh, future pricing. Everything that you can do to lower that baseline prior to converting is going to save you money. And even once you've converted, you always want to be able to control that consumption. And LPAR sets allows you to control it at a granular level uh, on the LPARs that are more expensive, as Selby described. Okay. In what release of Throughput Manager did support for LPAR sets become available? Uh, LPAR sets are available in the current level of Throughput Manager version 7, release 1. Are there provider controls to manage online workloads based on um, rolling four-hour average in addition to batch? Okay, do I need to repeat that, gentlemen? Are there plans for NAS to provide a control to manage online workloads based on the four-hour um, rolling average in addition to batch? Throughput Manager is designed to manage batch. It does not manage where online transactions go. So the simple answer is no. But the uh, other answer is that we do put out messages as various thresholds are reached that could be used with an automated operator to trigger other actions to influence your online load. Okay. Of the customer sites using ACM, what percentage of that customer base would you estimate is utilizing the LPAR sets concept? Well, LPAR sets are brand new. Um, we've got a, a customer that is using LPAR sets today very successfully, but we hadn't really made a big, uh, if you will, marketing splash about the particular enhancement. That's really what this webinar is all about, is to get the word out. Yeah, and that installation is a very large installation. So it's, it's had a, quite a workout, and it's been very successful. Um, is Throughput Manager appropriate for a customer who only has one production LPAR? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, because the way Throughput Manager works um, within each individual LPAR, it's not necessary to have multiple LPARs in order to save money. It's still going to be measuring your consumption on that LPAR and, and reducing it accordingly. Okay. Um, how will throughput manager help when the four-hour uh, rolling average is not a contributing factor for the pricing model used, if the pricing model is based on MIPS, DASD, and TAPE? I'm not really aware of any pricing model that wouldn't take into account consumption. And uh, the question does mention MIPS. MIPS is simply another term. Uh, the four-hour rolling average specifically is a four-hour rolling average of a metric referred to as MSUs, or millions of service units per hour. Millions of service units uh, is a, another metric that you could use uh, as MIPS, as CPU time. Uh, these are different metrics, if you will, but they all reflect the consumption of the workloads on the CPU. Uh, and unless you're paying for the capacity of the entire machine, you are paying for some level of consumption. The other thing I'd, I'd point out is that the automation part of Throughput Manager, uh, the service level manager that worries about loading the system, um, can help uh, reduce costs by allowing you to run in a tighter environment where it makes better decisions about what should run, what's the most important. And that component deals with the CPU peak usage as opposed to the four-hour rolling average. So really, we can put the two things together. But if you have something where you're just concerned about the peaks, the automation part deals with that. Okay, can Throughput Manager run 
LPARs that are our guests on ZVM. Throughput Manager is a ZOS uh, software product, so we would not directly run uh, in the, those LPARs. Okay. Is it true that the systems that can be included in an LPAR set is limited to the systems in a JESPLEX? Uh, no, that's not, not true. Um, the systems can be on, they don't even have to be in the same SysPlex, never mind in the same JESPLEX. It, an LPAR set consists of the ZOS L, as many of the ZOS LPARs on the same CPC. And this is similar to LPAR groups. IBM LPAR groups are the same way. The, the members of an LPAR group also do not have to be even in the same SysPlex. Uh, throughput manager, ACM, is aware of the CPU utilization and the four-hour rolling average of each of the LPAR, LPARs on the CPC. Okay. What shared DASD is required to use ACM? Well, ACM is just a component of Throughput Manager. Uh, Throughput Manager has a control file in much the same way that uh, JES2 has a checkpoint data set. Uh, so very small, um, you know, shared access. Uh, that's really it. We're not talking about a lot of storage here. And you're only talking about the JESplex scope. So from the ACM side, there's no actual requirement for any shared uh, disk at all between, uh, between members in order to handle uh, the ACM requirements, which is why ACM can, war can see things that aren't even in the same SysPlex. Okay. Well, I'm going to throw this one at you guys, and you don't have to um, name names, but someone's asking you to mm -hmm. compare your product to that of competitors in terms of, you know, of similar products that do the same function. Can you identify the benefit? Um, I'm not even sure anyone else is doing LPAR set, so I'll, I'll sure. show that one. No. No, happy, happy to take that question. Um, I mean, there are other uh, products that work in, shall we say, the space of attempting to control monthly license charges, but we're not aware of any product that actually reduces consumption, reduces demand anywhere. There are products that work with soft caps, so you can take the defined capacity, group capacity limits that IBM provides, and those products will adjust those limits dynamically. But that does nothing to uh, directly control the actual demand of the workloads, and certainly uh, such a product would be precluded from working without soft caps. So I don't believe there really is anything uh, directly competitive with us. Um, Selby, you got anything to add? I, I think that sums it up. We're the only people to reduce demand. There are some other products in this same uh, general space that will dynamically change limits. Okay, this is um, from a different person, but kind of ties in. What if I'm already using one of the third-party um, capping products already? So I think this kind of speaks to the whole idea of capping versus reducing demand. So the question was, um, what if I use one of third-party capping products already? The answer is that we do work with them, uh, and, and we are working with them. And uh, so they can change the limits, and we reduce demand. IBM offers online, read-only, and mobile transaction discounts. How would Throughput Manager fit in this model? Well, our, our pricing is, is very flexible, being a, being a small company. Uh, I'm really going to leave that to the marketing folks <laughs> to get into the specifics. But... Uh, Suffice to say that uh, we're certainly uh, fair and, and open to all sorts of options. Is there monitoring? Excuse me. Is there monitoring that indicates when throughput managers dynamically constrain the batch workloads, and likewise when those constraints are lifted? Yeah, absolutely. There are messages that are issued. 
uh, anytime what we call, we call the uh, capacity level, which is those percentages that we alluded to. So when the on each LPAR or LPAR group or LPAR set, when the capacity level changes, you would be notified of that. Uh, and we have a lot of customers that are taking those messages and, and triggering on them uh, to take action and so on. If you want to get additional displays, uh, they're available. There's a lot of good information in that space. Um, in addition to that, we have commands that allow you to interrogate the data and also in, as part of the analysis that occurs every five minutes on every LPAR, we put out an SMF record with the results of that analysis. So those can be looked at as well. Great. And we do have more questions coming in, uh, John and Selby, but I did want to um, let our attendees know that please continue to submit your questions even as we approach the top of the hour, because if we don't get to them here, somebody will be happy to reach out to you and, and answer your question via email. Um, here's the next one. Does throughput manager require a significant amount of CPU overhead? Oh, absolutely nope. not. <laughs> nope. I've been in performance for a long time. I measure these things. And um, look at what Jez uses. That's about what we use. Uh, um, we, we don't do as much as Jez, actually, John, I, I, I would say. Um, and uh, we, we spend a lot of time worrying about code path links and, and, and things like that. So the answer is no. It's, uh, it's very efficient. Great. Okay, here's someone appreciating the answer to your um, question, previous question, but want some further clarity. Just to be sure I understand this completely, he says, the LPARs would have to reside on the same CPC in order to be contained in one LPAR set. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, do you need throughput manager and all the, um, I'll start over. Do you need throughput manager on all the LPARs in the LPAR group? In the LPAR set? I think he meant LPAR I set. I thought that's what they mean. Yeah, he yes. did mean LPAR set. And the answer is no, you don't. And, and, a, <laughs> and a good example is the, uh, the special LPAR where it might be some other company's software and uh, they may not have licensed uh, throughput manager, which is a shame, but it happens. And uh, uh, you can still, on the other LPARs, they can still see the CPU consumption, and that LPAR can still be part of an LPAR set. Okay. And I just have to chuckle because I apologize to that attendee who, right after he wrote LPAR group, said, sorry, LPAR set, that is. So he did go there. <laughs> Okay. Um, is there a charge for your MSU analysis? Oh, absolutely not. No. Please uh, send us your data. We've done a, a number of analyses for uh, customers, and, and we're happy to look at your data and give you a, a, uh, a reasonable estimate of your costs before you go down the road of uh, installing any software. Okay. How do I determine what the limits should be for my LPAR set? Um, one of the ways you can do it is you can run them and see what they're coming in at and decide how much you want to uh, lower them. Uh, the way you can do that is when you define them, you don't provide a limit. And so you can then interrogate or examine the SMF records to see what the peak usage is, what the peak uh, for a rolling average is, for a particular LPAR set, so you have some idea what it's coming in at, and then you can set a limit later. But while it's in that mode, ACM won't take any action, so there's, there's no risk. It's simply basically in a monitor mode. If you've got your LPAR sets uh, divided up pretty much by product, any of those, you could look at your SCRT and see on that particular CPC what the, the current peak for our rolling averages for the last, say, maybe look at the last three reports for the last three months, and that will give you a good idea about what you're having now, and then you can decide, well, what would I like to lower it to, and then start doing that maybe in several steps, gradually lowering it to see how, how tight you can make it. Great. Thank you. Um, 
I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. Um, some great questions coming in. So I want, also want to thank our attendees for their participation today. It um, really adds great value. Um, thanks, everyone, for attending. And I especially want to thank John and Salvi for sharing their expertise with us today. I'm still getting some questions about sharing the presentation uh, with attendees. So just know that later this or next week, I should say early next week, we will be sending out a link. It will be um, a link to a recorded version of today's webinar, and there will be another link so that you can go ahead and download a PDF of the slide deck. That concludes our webinar. Thanks again, everyone, and have a great day.